So last fall, um, my husband and I made a journey of 2,900-ish miles from Washington State to Washington, D.C. And the worst part of the journey wasn't this part when we had um, a tire burst in our last 100 miles and I just wanted to be at our new home. That was really terrible. That was bad. That was bad. We took pictures. We did Instagram stories. We made sure the world knew we were alive because I'm so dramatic. But that was actually not the worst part of our trip. The worst part of our trip is we're driving through like Idaho or Iowa or South Dakota, one of those long states that takes like a million hours to get through. And it dawns on me, like, I don't know anyone in DC. Like, I know people who know people in DC, if that makes sense. Like, I have friends of friends, like adjacent friends who I see tagged and pictures online. But I was like, I don't have any friends. I don't know what church we're going to go to. So I go into full panic mode, and I start looking on Google, and I start looking on Eventbrite, and I'm like, okay. Because I'm an extreme extrovert, I was like, I should go to a networking thing. And because I also happen to be a military wife, I was like, okay, let me go to a networking thing for military wives. So somewhere in Iowa or Idaho or South Dakota, I promise you, I don't even remember the state. We were driving through, I sign up for this free networking event, um, and I order an outfit on Amazon because if you've ever moved, you know you can never actually find the clothing like that makes you look like a real human being when you need it, right when you move. And the event I signed up for, we were getting to DC, we, we left on a Monday morning, we were getting to DC on a Friday night, and the event was that Monday morning. So I Amazon an outfit, a teacher cardigan, shout out to my teachers, a teacher cardigan, not this one, um, and some professional pants and a professional shirt, and it was like $45, and I was like, this is, friendship is worth $45 in Amazon. So I did it, and I went, and I was actually really glad I went because as a result, let me see if this will cooperate with me. As a result, I ended up meeting I ended up meeting a really, really nice person, and she's pictured on my next slide. Um, on the end, farthest away from me, her name is Brenna. And let me see. Okay, I'm just gonna do weird motions with my hand. Does that work? <laughs> I'm good at being dramatic, so we'll, we'll move through. But um, if we, we'll eventually get to the picture of Brenna. I met this really wonderful woman, her name is Brenna, and um, she is also a military spouse. Oh, I can see, oh, look at Jesus. It's fine, guys, we're all friends. I've been here, I was like here last month. You guys remember me. Um, we'll go back one, but I met Brenna, and she is super fantastic. She's the one on the end in blue, and she was like so great. Like she wasn't like me, like I'm an extrovert, she's an introvert, but we found out we had a lot in common. And as a result of meeting her, I ended up going to like six more events that month. Like I wish I was kidding, but she was like, you should come to this and you should come to this. And I got like free headshots at some event because she's just so great at connecting people. And even later, when I ended up having a Galentine's event, you see here on social media, it looks like I have so many friends by February. It's a lie, all of these are brand Anna's friends. She invited people to become my friends because she's such a good friend. So anyway, I was thinking about what I would talk about when I came to this teaching and learning conference slash chapel slash we're spending time together, and I love that you guys are here. And I thought so many times, like me driving through fields and cornfields and empty fields in the middle of the USA, we get overwhelmed by the thought of being alone. And even though it feels like we're so able to connect with people because we have these little devices and we have social media, we have people's phone numbers, all those things. At the end of the day, even in a room like this, even in a room like this, someone may have come this morning feeling so alone. And so this morning, I want to talk with you guys for a few minutes on the topic of how we can connect, how we can actually connect in this disconnected world. Let's bow our heads for prayer again. God in heaven, I thank you so much that you've given us time to get together and to think about things like this. I pray for that person who's sitting here feeling like they are alone, maybe they're facing graduation, they don't know what's next. 
I pray that you speak to them this morning and give them the tools they need to continue to connect. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, so I'm, I'm going right into it, guys. We are so connected. Some of you guys are connected right now. Um, you know, you, you, you are connected with what's happening in the world around you. Let me give you, I feel like, I feel like a grandma coming back here and saying, well, when I was your age, we lived on Kephart Lane. I grew up in Berrien Springs. We lived on Kephart Lane. We had a computer room in the 90s. Like my dad had to use it at certain times for his schoolwork. I used to read the encyclopedia. You know those blue books that you read facts that expire every year? That was our Google, okay? But now you guys, and me too, in any second, in an instance of a second, you can open up your phone and you can look up anything that you want to have access to. And yet, we know that one in three of us, one in three adults and from ages 18 through older, feels lonely. And it's even worse for young adults because 61%, so that's like two in three, 18 to 25, are feeling very lonely right now. I'm not gonna make you raise your hand if you feel lonely because that's kind of sad. But then you should think about the person next to you, like if you're in the middle of two people, like turn, do they look lonely? Are they lonely? Maybe you're the lonely one, not you. I know I'm looking at you, so it feels very personal, but I'm not talking about you. It just might be you as you're sitting here. So I have to ask, we have to ask, with so many ways to connect, why do so many of us still feel very lonely? I recently um, was reflecting on this because, like I said, we moved across the country. We somehow tricked a bunch of our friends from church into helping us pack our moving van. But on our way there, I didn't know on the other end I would still be able to make friends who I could do life with. That, that's the end result, so now I know, okay, I had friends, but I didn't know that going in. And so I've been really fascinated lately about loneliness, connection, even tying it into our lives as educators, those of you who are going into education. And I want you guys to think about this question, how you are doing on the loneliness scale. This is not an introvert or extrovert question because introverts, my husband's introverted. Like, I know you guys like to like, be in your room and not talk to humans and stuff. That's really cute, but you need humans too. <laughs> it's not a like, temperament thing. All of us as humans, God created us in community. God is community. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So I want you to think about how you're doing on this loneliness scale. I recently read a book, it's so good. Guys, you should read books even after college because they're so fun. Um, I do it on audio though, and people are like, eh, that's not real, it's real, my brain remembers, okay? I read this book, it's called Platonic, it's so good, you should read it, it's all about relationships, even men, it's really fascinating, this is not in my notes, it's really fascinating, men, you need friends too, you need friends, you should read Platonic. Anyway, so when I was a kid, <laughs> I'm not that much older than you guys. I graduated 10 years ago, but still. When I was a kid, they used to say, like, sitting is the new smoking. And all that means is, like, in the 90s, they were like, don't do drugs. Smoking will kill you, right? And then in the 2000s, everyone's like, oh, no one's smoking anymore, but you're sitting a long time, so you're going to die. Now, <laughs> it's loneliness, okay? So there are over 100 factors, I think it's 106 factors, that can influence someone to have depression. But having someone to confide in, they have found through research, is the strongest preventer of that. So as I said about loneliness being the new smoking, it's akin, it's just like if you sat there and you smoked 15 cigarettes a day. That's the impact of you feeling like, I don't have someone to confide in. I can't connect. Right? One study found that the most profound difference between if you said, I am happy and I am unhappy, was not how cute you are or how great your selfies are, not even how much you go to church, because you can go to church and be lonely, y'all. It's real. Side note, my husband and I tried like 12 churches when we moved to DC. I'm not gonna name them, because there's no shade. We finally found a church. We drive 50 minutes to church because it is the church that made us feel not, I know we're weird, we're creepy Christians, but we love Jesus. Okay, so it's not about how religious you are, how often you go to church, because you can go to church and be lonely. It's not even how many good things happen to you. You're leaving college, you might get the dream teaching job. You might get a dream principal job. You might get a dream job in whatever field you're in. It's none of those things. It really comes down to your level of social connection. 
And I think we really have to internalize this. So I have a short video, I hope it's gonna play, but um, it ties into what I'm talking about with connection and I love it because it talks about a college setting for how connection impacts us. So let's go ahead and see if it, if it works. Well, the shortest okay. version of this story possible. Years ago, there was a famous mathematician. His name was Yuri Treisman, taught at UC Berkeley. And in his class, his Asian students were doing amazing and his black students were flaming out of that class. And so this bothered him. He asked his colleagues, why are they flaming out? And his colleagues gave him a bunch of answers like, well, maybe they came from unprepared schools and, you know, maybe they just don't understand the rigor. And he was like, nah, you can't get into this school without having like the academic chops, like something is up. So he asked his black students, he said, can I observe you for the next couple of weeks and just see how you're engaging with this material? And what did he find? He found that the black students were actually studying more than the Asian students, but the key was they were studying alone and the Asian students were studying in community. Fast forward, he made it mandatory that everybody would learn in, in groups and have learning communities. And within a couple of semesters, the black students were doing equally as well as the Asian students. What's my point? Stop trying to do everything by yourself. Stop struggling in isolation. Stop pushing help away. Stop feeling like I don't need anybody. Like, no, <laughs> okay? Life is hard and you can only take yourself so far. Self-made is never entirely self-made. Somebody had somebody somewhere give them a, a hand, an aid, a chance, something. So stop trying to do everything yourself and see how far you get this year. We absolutely need each other. There's no way leaving these gates of Andrews, that you are going to reach all that God has for you without leaning into the community God has in front of you. As a teacher, I taught for many years. <laughs> I say many years. I taught, it felt like a lifetime. I taught for four years before I became an administrator. And whether it was online community or the teacher across the hallway, I remember my first year, the teacher across the hallway, she was like, you are not going to get to everything in the curriculum and that's okay. And there was something so powerful about hearing someone else say that was okay. When I was an administrator, you know my first year at a larger school as an administrator, I was an administrator for five years, but when I moved to a larger school, that year was COVID and the pandemic. And I remember it was beginning of March, we're in Tampa for our principal meetings, because I was working in Florida at the time, and we're all sitting there, and we're like, oh yeah, school's gonna be closed for a couple weeks, let's share ideas. And then as the pandemic wore on and on, we really relied on each other through our virtual meetings to say, hey, are we okay? Like just doing mental health check-ins with each other. It's very, very important to lean into your community. You will go farther, you will be able to sustain what it is you think God has called you to, if you lean into the people who are around you. What does God have to say about community? Okay, I love this chapter and I'm assigning homework because we don't have time to read every verse, but Acts 2 is like the bomb.com, y'all. Like, the Bible is so exciting. Actually, okay, so right now this is unrelated. I'm in Job. <sighs> I should have chose something else to read this morning. It was not super exciting. I was like in this chapter and Job's friend is like, you're terrible. And that's what I read this morning. So praise God, he still inspired me to come and speak to you guys because Job is the struggle. But still, all of the Bible is good. That's not shade against the Bible. Anyway, we're talking about Acts. This is not related. In Acts, Acts chapter two, God is talking about, he's sharing with us, the disciples recount the story of when that fireball came from heaven and all this exciting stuff happened. So we're gonna jump around the chapter so we can encapsulate what is happening here, okay? So Acts chapter two, verse one starts, when the day of Pentecost came, they, these are followers of Jesus, some who saw him ascend, all these people were together in one place. They were like us. We're here for a few more minutes. It's great, it was great. They were together, they were happy, they were together. And all of them, this is verse four, all of them, can you guys imagine if we were in chapel, and every single person sitting here was like praying for the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness, I want this to happen, guys. Like, let's make it happen sometime. I'll come back, I'll come back. Just bring me back. We'll pray, it's great. I can't imagine, because I've never seen it, but I wanna see it. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. That means they spoke in different languages as the Spirit enabled them. So they were sharing in different languages. Now we skip down, so it's funny, because like a lot of drama happens, people are like, 
Are these people drunk? Like, it's really early in the morning. Why is everybody being cuckoo? And no, it was clear that God's spirit had fallen in that place when they were in what? In community. They were there together. It says all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold their property, they sold their possessions, and they gave to anyone who was in need that they identified. Every day, not just on Thursdays, not just on Sabbaths, every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread together. That means they ate. Chick-fil-A, I love Chick-fil-A. Oh, sorry. I should be vegan or vegetarian. Sorry, guys. Okay, let's focus. They broke bread together, veggie links, in their homes, and they ate with glad and sincere hearts, okay? And they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. But this is the clincher. This is the clincher, guys. God, the Lord, added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Okay. So I want to share with you guys, like you guys have to like what I'm sharing, kind of like put it in your pocket for like when you're, you're adults, but like when you're adult here and you're not at Andrews and you don't have all these fun things like chapels about athletes or like food fairs, store this in your pocket for when you're driving through Idaho and you don't know nobody, okay? Because right now you're probably like, I'm not lonely, I'm in the best place on earth. It's like Disney here. But in the real world, like people don't talk to each other at Trader Joe's, it's rough, okay? So store this in your pocket for the future. So reach their shows that it takes seven times of meeting someone to feel truly comfortable with them. When I read this, it changed everything I saw about Christian community. It changed everything I saw about my classroom. It changed all of it. Because there's a difference between saying hi and bye and stopping and being with someone. And I remember we were gonna start um, a Bible study when my husband and I were living in Washington State. And originally we said, oh, we're gonna meet with our Bible study like once a month, right? How many months would it take for us to like even care about these people? Seven. We would be like, oh, hey, Bob. And then we see him in a month. Oh, hey, Bob. This is why I said this is Disney. You guys see your friends like every other day. I remember when I was at Andrews, my friends would be in my dorm room. We would talk. We would go to worship together. You see them seven times in a day, and you're deepening that community. This is why, to my educators, your impact is so profound. You are having probably seven or more meaningful interactions with your students every day. Like it or not, you are probably becoming their safe space. You're becoming their most familiar space, sometimes even more than their parents. And so we have this duty, we have this calling as Christians to show up, to be present, because you could be here. We know, we've, some of us have been places, but we're not really there with our minds. We have this calling from God. I don't think the Holy Spirit just fell, because like, guys, if it were like, I don't want to say that easy. God wants to be with us, but like, if it just fell haphazardly, like, you guys would have fire over you right now, right? Like, he has to be like invited, and we got to have like hearts that are willing to accept it, and stuff like that please go to the seminary and like break that down because like I'm an educator and so I'm just here to talk about education. There are theological implications to that. But I'm saying that to say, when we position ourselves in community and the Bible says, where two or three are gathered, the Bible has a lot to say about community. It says, do not forsake the assembling. But I'm saying, I'm taking it one step further. I'm saying on purpose. I'm saying when we come together and we pray just this week, I was with my friend, she was so great. We were praying, and I'm gonna talk about her in a second. We were praying, we were walking, we were talking, and we really felt like, okay, God is gonna move in our lives. That is so, so powerful, because sometimes you don't feel like you're gonna see it, and sometimes God has to come in and see it for you. I wanna share, every time um, I get to, because I just, it's who I am. I was like talking about my story because it's my testimony and I get excited. Also, I really liked our bridesmaids dresses at our wedding. They were really great. I want to buy one for myself, but that doesn't make sense because I had a wedding dress. Anyway, the point is, this is how I have experienced community through my life. I have a best friend. She is also an educator. Find someone who does what you do. Or maybe not. It's okay. I could be friends with an engineer. But she's an educator. She's not on the same level. She teaches at the college level. I taught K-12, K-8 actually. Um, but for years, 
I was, I mean, there's highs and lows in the classroom. You go to school, you haven't slept because you're making your lesson plans. There's a kid who says you're ugly and your shoes look terrible. Actually, there was a kid my first year who was like, did you only bring one pair of shoes from Michigan because you wear the same shoes every day? And I was like, you are a booger. But I didn't say that because the Lord was in my heart. So anyway, the point is, I have experienced community because there were years and years and years where I would sit there with my friend. Her name's Heather. She's wonderful. She loves Jesus. And we'd be like, I'd be like Heather, I think I told you guys this when it came last month. Jesus is doing me dirty. Like, I serve him. I am his friend. Me and Jesus are BFFs, and I'm still single. What is going on? And then she had me by this tie because we're creepy Christians, and we prayed about it, and, like, it took years of praying. But the, the miracle isn't my husband, even though he's great and cute and wonderful. The miracle is when we're going through hard things as Christians, we, it really helps us to have people walking through them with us who aren't just there to like say, it's all gonna work out. Heather sat with me in my grief. I know it seems silly, because some of you like don't even care about boys right now, but you might, you might, it's good. He's great, he's wonderful, he's at home. The point is, in my grief, I was able to keep showing up for my students, I was able to keep giving, because I was also being filled in community. And I think that's true of so many of us. So many of us are going through really hard things Maybe you're supporting someone who's going, maybe you yourself are going through a long-term illness. We don't know what the people in this room are facing, but I've seen in my own life that I came out on the other side. You can come out on the other side, but your faith can be broken. I came out on the other side with a stronger faith because we prayed through it together. And so like, if there's anything you take from Andrews, find a prayer partner. Because she and I met, we met like down the hill, you know where the cows used to be? They're not here anymore, right? Okay, there used to be cows on this farm place, college campus. Um, we worked at flag camp together, the day camp that used to be down that hill, and that's how we met. And then we started praying, and then it got great because I would tell her about my boy problems, and then I eventually got married. That's not the moral of the story. The moral of the story is to make friends. I just, I don't know how to say it more or better. Um, make friends, but also be a friend. Be the kind of friend that you want to be. I am a friendship evangelist, so I'm always gonna want you guys to be friends and make more friends, even if you're an introvert. Even if you're an introvert, everyone needs friends. Oh, speaking of, come be our friends tonight. Um, 4.30, we'll feed you, but if you need a link to sign up, email, don't email me, just find me in the lobby, I'm wearing red. Um, get in touch with Dr. Bakayoki. We have more stuff this evening, and we're gonna talk about how to become a multiplier, so then you can multiply your friends, and then you can be exciting. So um, whether you are education or not, everyone can come, right, Dr. B? Everyone can come. We're welcoming all our friends, and you're already my friends because I've been here twice, so we're basically, well, actually, you have to register because we won't feed you. We will, but we need to know how, okay, I am botched it, but you know what I mean. Find us, find us and come be in our community. I would argue, because I said I'm a friendship evangelist, I think the only way, I know this might be controversial, because I do think you need like your prayer closet, oh, sorry, your prayer closet where you like talk to God one-on-one, -on -one, like you need that. But I would argue that I don't think you're fully experiencing God unless you're also fully connected to Christian community. That's what I would argue. So my plea to you is even if once you leave Andrews, you're like, I can't find a church around me that I feel like is good, drive 45 minutes. Because like for my husband and I, it does a lot for us just to do that. Find your people, find your community. Don't forsake the assembling together. There's a full verse there. You know what I mean, you know what I mean. Okay, I think um, I'm gonna pray now, but I want you to think about who is your tribe? Who are you taking with you from Andrews? And how can God use those people to continue to multiply what he's doing in your life? Let's pray. God in heaven, I know it's a little silly right now, God, but like, I know they know what I mean. So like, just water the seeds that you have planted in each person's heart here. If someone is feeling like they are the only person in the world going through what they're going through, Lord, bring someone into their life to show them that they don't have to walk it alone, that you have people on this campus, in these churches, here in Berrien Springs that can connect with them and reach them, even when they go home for the summer, even when they graduate, that we need community, God. Help that seed to grow. We ask all these things in your holy name. Amen.